Today, I've put together the most savage and brutal polar bear attacks we've covered on this channel so far. From polar bears ripping into a student's tent during a field trip, an arctic hunter who gets eaten alive in front of his kids, and much more. Hit that like button and subscribe right now. These are the most terrifying polar bear attacks you'll ever hear. Welcome to Final Affliction. Polar bears are known to be one of the most fearsome predators in the natural world. You've all heard the advice when coming across a bear. If it's brown, lay down. If it's black, fight back. If it's white, good night. Luckily, polar bear attacks are very rare, and there have only been a few recorded fatalities. Despite this, the number of bear attacks worldwide have gradually been increasing over the last couple decades due to increased food scarcity and habitat destruction, which is forcing these animals to leave their natural environment and encroach onto human territory in search of food. What little habitat these animals have left is often used for hunting and hiking by humans, leaving them with very few places to go and the likelihood of encountering someone increases. While brown bears have always been the main perpetrators of these bear attacks in North America, there is an alarming trend growing as polar bear attacks are on the rise. Aaron Gibbons was 31 years old in 2018 and was considered to be an incredibly experienced and talented hunter. He was a family man, someone who put his three children above all else and kept them safe no matter what. He lived in Arviat, an area known to be very remote, suffering incredibly cold temperatures through the winter, which means that the community must help each other out if they are to survive the season. Aaron regularly used his hunting skills for the good of his community, selflessly providing meat for those in need. Aside from the cold, the area shared its land with an apex predator, the polar bear. Despite the close proximity, there had not been an attack in the area for 18 years and the indigenous people knew to leave the animals alone, creating an understanding between the bears and the people of mutual respect and solitude. Naturally, there had been encounters regardless and so a patrol had been set up on the outskirts of town to protect the inhabitants and redirect any bears who got too close to the settlement. Aside from a few interactions, there was relative harmony between the people and the bears. On July 3rd, Aaron decided to visit Sentry Island with his children to take them fishing and spend some quality time with them. The island was around 10 miles away from their home by boat and was a regular fishing spot for locals and tourists alike, particularly as it was a hot spot for beluga whales. The family planned on gathering some bird eggs on the island, and as soon as they landed on the island, the children ran off the boat, excited to spend time with their dad for the day. After explaining some of the dangers, the children headed off to collect their eggs. Aaron was proud to see how excited they were and was ready to slowly teach them everything he knew so that they could grow up protected by his knowledge. While watching the children, he spotted something in the distance and the longer he stared at it, the colder his blood turned. A polar bear was slowly stalking his youngest daughter, creeping closer and closer to where she was searching. The bear's ears were facing backwards, signaling to Aaron that the bear considered his daughter to be prey, and he knew that there was no way that she would win the fight against the bear. At this time, she was completely unaware, assessing a nearby bird's nest to see which eggs she should take back to her dad. There was no time left. Aaron shouted out to his children, telling them to run to the boat as fast as they could. He sprinted towards them, trying to get between the bear and the children, but as he ran, he realized he had left his rifle on the boat and so was currently running towards a hunting polar bear with no protection but his bare hands. He began grabbing rocks instead, hurling them at the animal in an attempt to distract it or to scare it away from his children. Aaron was desperate and knew he would do anything he could to save his children. Suddenly, a few of his rocks throws hit the animal and confused, it stops tracking the children. He was so thankful that his children were no longer in the animal's eyeline that it took him a second to realize that all of the bear's attention was now fixed on him instead, and he was completely unarmed. He shouted to his eldest daughter on the boat, telling her to call for help on the radio, and continued to try to throw rocks at the bear to scare it off. Quickly, Aaron realized that this wouldn't work as the bear continued to approach him, and he decided to break all the rules. He turned his back on the animal and ran for the boat. He could hear the bear behind him and knew that it was going to be much faster than him. He just needed to get close enough to the boat so that his daughter could throw him the rifle. It was his only chance. He ran along the shore, praying that he would be able to make it back to his children in time. 
Unfortunately, polar bears run at 30 miles per hour, and so it was impossible for him to outrun the bear. He looked at his children one last time and was pulled to the ground as the bear leapt onto him from behind. The animal grabbed him by the neck and began throwing him from side to side, the strength of the bear making Aaron seem like a ragdoll in its grip. The pain must have been excruciating as his body was thrown into the rocks and ice beneath them as his children were forced to watch. When he stopped moving, the bear climbed upon him and began to eat him, finally ending the life of Aaron Gibbons. The children were traumatized and begged for someone to come and help them over the radio. They hid in the boat, listening to the sounds of their father being devoured by the predator. Their prayers were soon answered as an emergency team arrived and took the children away before shooting and killing the polar bear. Aaron's body was half eaten at this point and so he was taken back to his family and community in Arviat. Everyone was devastated by the loss. He was an important part of the community and well liked by all. His sacrifice was not in vain as he saved his three children, despite losing his life. Two years later, his bravery was recognized in a Canadian ceremony by the Governor General and Commander-in-Chief of Canada, Julie Payette. He received the Star of Courage for the defense of his children, and although he was not alive to receive it, his family were able to keep it as a physical reminder of the courage of Aaron, who was truly a hero to his family, before ultimately meeting his final affliction. Torngat Mountains National Park lies on the Labrador Peninsula in the province of Newfoundland and Labrador. The park is famous for its gorgeous snow-covered mountaintops and breathtaking wilderness. The park is home to many a wild creature including wolves, golden eagles, reindeer, and of course, polar bears. The polar bear is undoubtedly one of nature's most refined killing machines. Weighing over 750 kilos of pure muscle and growing as far as 10 feet tall, an adult male can bite with a force that is equal to 1,200 PSI, more than enough to crack a full-grown human skull as if it were an egg. Unlike his brown cousin, the grizzly bear, who will shy away from humans and only attack if disturbed or otherwise threatened, the polar bear is hyper-aggressive towards humans and is mainly a carnivorous animal. Most, if not all, of his diet consists of meat that he usually hunts on his own. This basically means that the polar bear is a much more experienced hunter than his relative, so it's no wonder that polar bears are among a select few of apex predators on planet Earth that have developed a taste for human flesh and will go out of their way to actively hunt and eat humans if given the chance. Within the Arctic Circle lies the polar bear's native range where it primarily hunts seals. But when seals are difficult to come by, these bears can survive off of eating just about anything, including fish, birds, rodents, and even human garbage. Additionally, polar bears have an acute sense of smell which allows them to accurately track prey up to a mile away. This is the disturbing story of a nature-loving man who was unlucky enough to be on the receiving end of one of these beasts' powerful jaws, helplessly getting mauled as his ligaments tore and bones shattered while his friends could only watch in horror. The conclusion to this horrifying story will undoubtedly surprise you. Matt Dyer was a 48-year-old lawyer living in Easton, Maine in Aroostook County who was obsessed with all things nature. He'd frequently spend his vacations going on hiking trips, his obsession with nature reaching a point where tattoos of various wildlife creatures were riddled across his body. His story began in the winter of 2012 when Dyer felt the urge to go on yet another grand adventure. As he was browsing through a magazine, he saw an ad for an outing to the Torngat National Park in Labrador, Canada. Matthew Dyer had never heard of it before, nor had he ever seen a real-life polar bear but felt reasonably intrigued by what he read and decided to sign up for the trip after doing a bit of research. Before leaving on the trip, Dyer's main concern was that he wouldn't be in good enough physical condition. To make sure he could traverse the terrain, he trained all winter, carrying around a heavy backpack while exercising regularly. The journey to Torngat necessitates careful planning, registration with park officials, a lengthy approval process, and the carrying of appropriate equipment to ensure things go smoothly for all participants. Additionally, anyone visiting the park is obliged to view a DVD on polar bear safety. It's extremely easy to get lost in Torngat Park as there are no roads, no campgrounds, and no directional signs indicating what to visit or where to go. When hiking in the park, visitors are instead strongly advised to hire a certified polar bear guard not only for protection, but for guidance should they find themselves lost. Excited, Dyer later flew with a group of like-minded explorers from Montreal to a town called Cujouac, which lies in northern Quebec. From there, the group made their way to a base camp, 
where a plane would arrive to hoist them over the Torngat Mountains and eventually onto the coast of Labrador. The trip was led by two of the senior Sierra Club hikers, Sierra Club being a nonprofit organization dedicated to conservation and education regarding nature and the wildlife that inhabits it. The first guide was 60 year old Rich Gross, who originally worked for a low income housing nonprofit in San Francisco, but since 1990, he'd spend a week or two each year acting as a tour guide on adventure trips all around the world. Accompanying him was fellow tour guide Marta Chase, a 59-year-old medical diagnostics consultant who'd been leading hiking trips ever since she attended high school. Tagging along with her was her husband, Kikab Castaneda Mendez. Dyer, being the nature-loving enthusiast he was, would have loved nothing more than to see a real polar bear in the wild, but he thought he'd be extremely lucky if he actually saw one. As a result, he was thrilled when tour guide Rich Gross did going on a hike that would almost certainly result in the group coming into contact with the park's population of polar bears. After hiking for a while, Rich Gross announced now would be the time to set up a camp. The camp consisted of a few tents to sleep in, a cooking area to cook and store food, and, perhaps more importantly, an electrified fence that stretched around the campground. A fence that was advertised as being capable of delivering an electric shock powerful enough to scare off any wandering predator, even though it was just powered by a couple of double-D batteries, the same ones you'd likely find in a standard flashlight. The group knew the potential danger they were embarking on, yet they elected not to hire a dedicated polar bear guard, instead opting to just carry around flare guns and bear spray that they felt would be enough to quickly get rid of any unwanted bear encounters. After going to sleep at around 10 p.m., the group woke up the next day early in the morning to the sound of one of their fellow members announcing that he'd seen a polar bear close by the beach. Dyer quickly jumped out of his bed to witness the majestic animal. As he and the group made their way to where the bear was spotted, they soon saw a mother bear and her few-month-old cub only a few hundred yards away from where they set up camp. He was overwhelmed with joy. His eyes were fixated on the mother's every move, and he sat there admiring the creature's natural beauty, especially the young cub who he thought looked like a cute stuffed animal. Eventually, Gross announced it was time to head back to camp to have breakfast. After eating, they all geared up and went out to explore the mountains. They hiked through some of the most breathtaking views of nature. The icy lakes, the snow-covered mountains, the crystal blue water. It was all perfect. In the near evening at about 4 p.m., they stopped near their camp and decided to relax for some time as they were exhausted and their feet were sore due to hours of hiking. As they hunkered down, Dyer spotted a dangerous figure 100 yards away that seemed to be stalking the group. It was a full-grown male polar bear, 10 feet tall, larger than any bear they'd ever seen. Compared to the female bear they had previously seen, this bear was twice as big and had a broader coat. It approached them slowly, putting out its tongue and sticking its nose in the air as if it were evaluating the two-legged creatures it had just come upon. They spared no effort to scare the bear away as he kept getting closer, grouping together to appear larger and more intimidating and making loud noises. However, this did little to stop the bear who was now rapidly approaching them from less than 50 yards away as it appeared that hunger or curiosity had overcome his sense of fear. Rich had no choice but to pull out his flare gun and fire it at the beast. The animal continued to move closer to them as the flare was shot. However, the bear turned and raced off in a dead sprint when the shot landed in front of it, causing a second blast. Realizing the danger they put themselves in by sitting down outside the relative safety of their camp, they quickly gathered their things and made a beeline back to their tents. The crew was ecstatic when they arrived at camp since adrenaline was surely pumping through their bodies. Everyone appeared to believe the danger was over, except for Dyer, who was uneasy about the whole situation and felt that the bear wouldn't give up that easily unless it had a plan. And as it turned out, it did. As the bear would later be seen a few hundred yards from the camp Dyer and his team had established, it would simply sit there for hours peering at the camp from a distance, as though studying their behavior or looking for the easiest target. Gross wasn't concerned. That's what the fence is for, he told the group. After all, Gross had done his homework. He'd researched polar bear behavior and double-checked the fence that evening to make sure the wires were taut and the battery was turned on for added security. As much as Dyer's crew assured him they were safe inside the camp, he still could not bring himself to fall asleep. So Matt positioned himself outside of his tent and stared down the bear as it watched them while the rain poured down. 
He remained there for over an hour, gazing at the bear and being soaked by the gloomy gray sky as the day wore on before finally giving in and going to sleep. The crew spent the entire day of July 23rd observing the bear with binoculars. The bear appeared calm and unthreatening, spending the majority of the day dozing out. Later that night, a group member by the name of Eisenberg decided to check up on the bear's whereabouts before dinner, but discovered it had mysteriously vanished from its original location and was nowhere to be seen. On July 24th, at 3.30 p.m., the group would be woken up by the sound of blood-gurgling screams coming from Dyer's tent. As it would appear, the electric fence was not enough to stop the 10-foot bear who easily managed to break through it and reach Dyer. The unsettling shrieks startled Rich to wakefulness. He reached into his boot close to his head and pulled out a flare gun. He ripped the zipper off his sleeping bag and jumped from his tent. Marta Chase's tent was right next to Rich's. She was terrified when she heard the frightening growls of an adult polar bear coming from the tent next to hers as she made her way outside and peered through a small window. The bear looked enormous and white as snow, aside from the black on its eyes and snout. The beast ignored Rich as its eyes were fixated on Dyer. It wrenched helpless Dyer from his tent by the head and began flailing his body around left and right like a rag doll, his sharp fangs tearing through flesh and slicing through bone, while the group watched in utter disbelief. After Dyer stopped moving, the bear leaped over the electrified fence with Dyer's skull in between his jaws and made a run for it, likely hoping to reach the nearby beach where he could then drown his victim and enjoy his meal without disturbance. It was now 3.32 a.m. Even though it was pitch black, Gross and Chase could still make out that the polar bear was running away with one of their traveling companions in its mouth. And things weren't looking good as Dyer seemed to have stopped yelling for help. Rich and fellow group members gave chase, with Rich firing and hitting the bear with multiple rounds of double flares, a special type of flare gun ammunition that explodes twice before the bear finally loosened his clamp on Matt's neck and vanished into the darkness. When Rich finally reached Dyer's body, he was badly injured and unconscious, his jaw was crushed, his neck and lungs were punctured, he couldn't feel anything, he could barely breathe, and he was bleeding profusely. Rich attempted to radio for help, but was informed that because the region was currently entirely shrouded in fog, there was no prospect of them receiving it till it was clear. The group tended to Dyer's wounds as best they could as they waited for rescuers to come save Matt. At 8.30 a.m., after nearly seven hours, the clouds began to clear, and the reassuring sound of a helicopter engine finally echoed from afar and looked to be moving toward them. Matthew Dyer was promptly strapped to a carrier and hoisted onto the chopper. From there, he went back and forth to various medical centers, with none being suitably equipped to offer the kind of care that he desperately needed. Upon arrival, doctors would re-administer sedatives previously given to Matt before patching him up again and recommending a different medical facility. Eventually, Matt would arrive at the Montreal Central Hospital, where he would finally receive the care he needed. Medical reports regarding Matthew Dyer's condition were astonishing. The bones in his left hand were pulverized, both of his jaws were crushed, one of his lungs and part of his throat were punctured, and one of his vertebrates was broken. Yet despite all that, miraculously no vital organs or arteries were damaged, which explains how he managed to survive as long as he did. Even more shocking was that even though the 750-pound polar bear was flailing him around by the head, Matt managed to survive with his spinal cord largely intact. Jean Wells, Matt's wife, learned about the horrific incident and traveled to Montreal to be at her husband's side. On the 27th of July, doctors would inform Jean and Dyer's tour mates, who all came over to see how he was doing, that Matt's condition was stabilized and that he could be discharged in a matter of weeks. Fast forward to the present day and Matt has made a complete recovery. His love for nature and the outdoors hasn't faded one bit. He even got a brand new tattoo of a polar bear to symbolize his life or death encounter with this ferocious predator. Matt's physical recuperation from the bear assault may have taken a while, and although his voice was left permanently affected as a result of an injury sustained to his vocal cords, he now feels emotionally stronger and all the more appreciative of the people who contributed to his survival. Matt's fascinating story is quite an oddity. Very few animals, let alone people, survive an encounter with a full-grown male polar bear, especially not one who managed to clamp down on their heads with his powerful jaws. In the end, Matt probably survived off of pure luck, and his experience now serves as a constant reminder that nature and its wild creatures are not to be taken lightly. Any situation can turn nasty at any time. 
and before you realize it, you could be standing at the threshold of death, watching in horror as your grip on life crumbles before you, witnessing nothing but darkness after suffering your final affliction. In one of the world's most northwestern areas in between Norway and the North Pole, you would find a cluster of small islands known as Svalbard. Although conditions are very harsh and the landscape desolate, you can still find about 2,500 people living on Svalbard, fighting with the elements every day. If the freezing temperatures and frequent snowstorms were not enough to contend with, the residents are also outnumbered by one of the deadliest predators in the world, the polar bear. There are frequent bear attacks as the animals search for food and frequent deaths as a result for both people and the polar bears. Despite these risks, Svalbard is known to have a beautiful variety of Arctic wildlife, some that can only be seen on Svalbard itself. Tourists come to the area to see Svalbard reindeers, Arctic foxes, walruses, and a number of seal and whale species. Many also come to specifically see the polar bears as their numbers are still decreasing, so many believe it may be their last chance to see this amazing animal in the wild. However, extra care must be taken around these animals, or the worst might happen. Horatio Chapel was just 17 years old in 2011 when he visited Svalbard with the British Schools Exploring Society for an adventure holiday. His parents were concerned about the possibility of bear attacks, but were told that many safety precautions were in place and so they relented and allowed him to go. He was described as inquisitive, hardworking, and determined, and was well liked by his peers. He had a passion for medicine and was expected to become a brilliant doctor. However, this trip would change everything, and unfortunately, Horatio would not be able to fulfill his dreams. The group arrived in Svalbard on July 23, 2011, and consisted of 80 people in total, including adults and teenagers. The trip was supposed to be over a month long, with long hikes and cramped tents, but memories for a lifetime. Two weeks had passed, and they were halfway through their trip. Everyone was now firm friends as they bonded over the hardships of their experiences. Horatio was having an amazing trip, and on August 5th, he went to sleep in his tent, feeling excited about what the next day would hold. Earlier that day, the group had seen some polar bear footprints, but as the animal was common in this area, there was no immediate concern, and they were simply amazed to see any sign of the bears. That night, Horatio was sharing his tent with two other friends, Scott Benel Smith, 16, and Patrick Flinders, 17. At around 7.30 a.m., Scott was suddenly awoken by the tent shaking. He thought he was being shaken awake by someone when suddenly the tent was ripped apart by a skinny male polar bear. It was clear that he hadn't eaten for some time, which many believed fueled the bear's aggression towards the group. As the bear struck out, he hit both Scott and Patrick, who sustained head and back injuries. Patrick, who had survived the terrifying attack, but was left with horrifying facial scars, later recalled what happened that night. While sleeping in his tent, he woke up from the tent being shaken violently. Within seconds, the tent collapsed down on him and his friends with great force. By the time he lifted the collapsed tent's fabric away from his face, an aggressive polar bear began swiping and snapping at his face. Its claws were huge and sliced through his skin effortlessly. The blood around its mouth and nose was easy to see because of its white fur, and at this moment, Patrick thought he was going to die. Patrick threw his arms in front of his face to protect himself from the attack when suddenly he felt the bear's teeth clamp down around his elbow and the bear forcing his arm away from his face before biting down on his skull. I could hear it crack, he said, and then I heard a growl which was deafening because I was so up close. In a last ditch effort to save himself from being devoured by the bear, he punched the bear repeatedly in the face until it miraculously let go and set its sights on Horatio. Matthew Burke was in another tent but was awoken by the screams of his friends as they shouted to alert the camp of the bear. He saw Horatio being dragged along the snow. The bear had a firm grip upon his head, and when it let go it reared up and slammed itself down onto Horatio's body. It is thought that if he hadn't been killed by the severe head injury that had already occurred, this was the moment that Horatio sadly passed away. The group panicked and the noise woke one of the adults, Michael Reed. He grabbed a rifle and left the tent, aiming to save the young man. He lined up the shot, cocked the rifle, and fired. But the bullets fell to the ground. He tried to fire more rounds, but the rifle was not working. Now, the bear had his sights on Michael. Fear filled his body as he realized that this bear would try to eat him while he had nothing to defend himself with. 
The bear was quickly upon him and he felt the animal's teeth sink into his head. The pain was indescribable, but he had to focus if he was going to survive. From his training, he knew that the weakest part of the polar bear would be its eyes and so attempted to gouge them in an attempt to escape. But the bear was unfazed and continued to maul him. Mountain leader Andrew Ruck then charged at the bear, trying to distract it for long enough so that Michael could escape. He shouted and threw rocks, but then the bear turned on him too. He was knocked to the ground and the bear was on top of him, swiping at his head. He stared at the bear, thinking that this would be his last moment on earth, praying that he would be able to escape. Thankfully, his prayers were answered. Once Michael had escaped, he was able to grab the rifle, reload it, and with a massive bang, he shot the bear dead. They were safe and had survived an attack from one of the deadliest animals in the world. Considering the risk assessments and safety protocols that were in place, how did this incident even happen? Why was a young man killed when his parents were assured that there was no danger to their son? All of the group were supposed to be given pen flares as well as trip wires around the camp to alert them of nearby bears. After an inquest, it came to light that this was not actually the case. The pen flares are small devices that will shoot out flames up to 50 meters and was designed to scare off approaching bears. Unfortunately, it was revealed that only the team leaders had these devices, not all members of the group. This was a critical issue, as if Horatio or any members of his group had these devices, they would have been able to fire them at the bear and would potentially have avoided a fatality. The team leader explained that, while it was their plan to give everyone a pen flare, they realized once they got to base camp that they had not packed enough. A fatal mistake. But how did the bear get this close in the first place? The tripwire surrounding the camp was meant to alert the group of approaching animals with a large bang from the firing of the device. There are usually four devices set up around a camp using corner pasts attached to fine fishing line, which would act as the tripwire. The fishing line had been exchanged for fluorescent cord to avoid false firing, and the devices themselves were not complete as there was a shortage of triggers. Ultimately, the protections set up around the camp were not enough and the devices did not fire when they were most needed. In addition, due to the presence of the tripwires, the leaders believed it was safe enough to not organize a bear watch, meaning everyone simply went to bed rather than watch out for bears. They believed that the tripwires were enough to alert them instead if there was a bear approaching them. Another fatal mistake. The last issue is the rifle that was used. There was only one rifle taken on this trip and it misfired several times, which caused two more members of the group to be attacked by the bear. The rifle in question was a Mauser 98K rifle, which dated back to the Second World War. It was improperly stored and handled, and the training of the team was extremely limited. The final fatal mistake. After the team returned home and Horatio's body was returned to his family, the inquest found that the British School Exploring Society did not act criminally negligible under criminal law, but admitted that his death was caused by a number of unfortunate circumstances. His parents tried to appeal this decision, but Norwegian prosecutors also agreed that no criminal charges could be brought. Instead, to help the family grieve, they set up a charity in Horatio's name called Horatio's Garden. When he was alive, he would volunteer at Salisbury Spinal Center and suggested that a garden should be created away from the wards, giving the patients and their families somewhere beautiful to visit. There are currently eight of these gardens across the UK, and in 2019, HRH Princess Eugenie of York became a royal patron of the charity. Even in death, Horatio has been able to change the lives of countless patients and their families. Researcher Stephen Riley had been deployed in the Arctic Circle to investigate the melting ice caps and the impact of global warming on the wild and marine life in the frozen vast expanse. Stephen had always wanted to witness the northern lights in the night sky, so he was glad that he got the chance to be there at just the time when Aurora Borealis is most clearly visible. It was a serene, heavenly place away from the distractions of life. He and his team had been staying at a caravan trailer parked a few miles from where they needed the samples. For the week that they stayed at the site, the night sky would sometimes be a clear, star-studded window into outer space, and other times a spectacular display of colors in the sky from the Aurora Borealis. But inhabiting this beautiful place were beasts that had seldom encountered humans. The most ferocious of these is the polar bear. 
At over two meters in height and weighing more than 1,000 pounds, these mammals were comfortable at the top of the Arctic food chain, feeding on everything from seals, walruses, and even beluga whales. However, global warming and the melting of the polar ice caps had been depleting the natural marine life of the area, and polar bears were starting to go long stretches of time hungry and without hunting. Stephen Riley finally got a chance to witness the Northern Lights about a week into their research trip, and he took several photographs of the beautiful display before returning to his caravan. In contact with his supervisor over the phone, Stephen was instructed to collect more samples of the thinning ice a few miles from their caravan. He was frustrated with his supervisor and tried to explain that the lack of marine life in this frozen wasteland was enough evidence that ice was thinning due to global warming. The supervisor on the phone refused to budge and ordered him to collect and bring back more samples for research. Stephen angrily hung up the phone and decided to get it over with by going out into the freezing cold and getting the ice samples himself. He chose a site about a few kilometers from their caravan for the ice samples, but the foot-deep snow and blazing cold winds made it extremely difficult and time-consuming to walk there. He had no choice but to bring back the samples, which he thought would prove to his supervisors that he was right all along. Global warming had caused ice sheets on the water to melt and crack, leaving floating islands of ice separated by several feet of freezing water. Stephen had to hop from one sheet to the next and slowly make his way to the chosen site. He finally identified an appropriate spot to chisel off a piece of ice on the edge of the floating sheet. He crouched down and took out his tools for the job. Hunched over right on the cusp of the ice-cold water, he heard light splashes followed by a grunt. He couldn't get a good view of what it was and dismissed the sound for a whale or seal beneath the water. He heard the grunt again, and this time it sounded louder and closer. He realized it was not coming from beneath the water, but from behind him. He turned back and spotted a massive body of white fur over seven feet tall right as it jumped to him. Frightened out of his senses, he instinctively ducked and felt the sharp claws of the animal scratch his shoulder as it plunged into the water on the other side. Stephen quickly realized the vulnerability of his circumstance. He had no transportation, no weapon, and no communication to contact his colleagues at the camp. He was alone in the vast frozen wasteland several miles away from safety, and all he had was a small can of bear spray in his backpack. He had only a few seconds to frantically search for it with his freezing and jittery cold hands before the polar bear clambered out of the water and ran after him once again. From the weight of the massive bear jumping at Stephen, the floating ice sheet wobbled and tilted, further throwing him off. He spotted the head of the beast coming out of the water as he unzipped his bag and rummaged through it trying to find the spray can. He finally found it and immediately turned around to spray the bear that was now charging right toward him. The intense and pungent smell of the chemicals inside the bear spray threw it off momentarily as it turned around and jumped back into the water. Stephen realized he had just bought himself a few more seconds to escape. He dropped his bag where it was and made a run for the caravan as fast as he could. The adrenaline was pumping, his heart was beating fast as he jumped from one ice sheet to the next, spraying the can behind him as he went. In desperation and the pain from his wound, he slipped on the sheet of ice and dropped the bear spray which landed right in the water. He didn't have the time to recover it or the heart to look back, so he continued running as fast as possible in the direction of his caravan. As he ran, he tripped again on the edge of an ice sheet while trying to jump from one to the next. This time, he plunged into the water. The icy cold water drained him of any heat or energy that Stephen's body had retained by this point as he splashed around trying to get back up on his feet. However, before he could even get out of the water, he noticed the loud growls of the bear swimming behind him. His hands and legs numb from the freezing water made it much harder for him to get up and run. He let out a scream in terror. The bear got out of the water behind him and charged at Stephen. A terrifying huge mass of fur. The sight of the predator running towards him with vicious intent numbed his senses. He was barely able to crawl now. With the caravan only a half a kilometer away, he tried desperately to scream to his colleagues at the campsite, but to no avail. The bear finally caught up to him, and by this time, the bear spray had been washed off its nose from swimming in the water. Now, there was nothing that could stop Stephen from being eaten alive by the hungry polar bear. He was left defenseless, numb, and terrified out of his senses. The bear stood up on its two hind feet and then slammed its two front feet straight onto Stephen's neck, snapping it in half. Stephen's fate was now sealed. 
The bear ripped its claws into his torso and neck and he could only let out a slight squeal in his final moments before being devoured by the bear piece by piece. All that was later found by his colleagues at the spot was a few torn clothes, some bones and flesh, and a reddened spot in the white snow that told the tale of Stephen's final affliction. Being the largest carnivorous land animal on the planet, polar bears are unstoppable. They have no known predators other than their own kind and humans equipped with guns. They are fast, strong, excellent swimmers, and great hunters. Although attacks on people are sporadic, there have been numerous instances in the past where polar bears have hunted and killed people. After setting five world aviation records, Sergei found himself contemplating another run. It was there again in the back of his mind, an incessant nine that got more prominent at night, the familiar call to adventure. However, this time Sergei wanted something different, something that would set him apart from the rest, a legacy that would echo through time. In 2013, Sergei broke two world records that had stood for more than 50 years, flying the Robinson R-22 helicopter for 1,232 kilometers from Moscow to Ufa, breaking the record for the most distance without landing. From there, he broke the most distance over a closed circuit record by flying 1,062 kilometers in Moscow. Some people are simply born different. They're the ones with fires housed in their chests the people who try to capture lightning in a bottle. These men wanted to become the first at something. Sergei was undoubtedly one of these people. He wanted to be the first person to complete a solo flight around the world in a small helicopter weighing less than one metric ton. There had only been one successful attempt at circumnavigating the world in a helicopter. However, the run involved a support aircraft trailing behind to prevent mishaps, carrying extra fuel and supplies. Additionally, it was done in a larger, sturdier helicopter. The R-22 was a small aircraft used for training and patrolling, microscopic tasks compared to circumnavigating the globe. To say this was a challenging endeavor is an understatement, even downright absurd. There was a reason nobody had done it before. On June 13, 2015, Sergei took flight from an airfield at Shevlino, Russia, a few miles from Moscow. He expected the entire trip to be smooth sailing, and just like that, the quest of circumnavigating the globe was underway. The first order of operation was to cross Siberia. After just six days of flying, Sergei reached Yakutsk on Wednesday. At this point, he had already completed more than 55 hours of flying, with a distance of more than 8,500 kilometers. Eventually, Sergei reached Canada and crossed the Hudson Strait toward Akalowit the Nunavut Territory's Inuit capital. He intended to fly to Greenland that morning. However, something was amiss with the weather conditions. No matter, he thought, he was near the end goal after all. Suddenly, things went terribly wrong. Sergei's helicopter malfunctioned as he flew over the tiny slither of freezing ocean between Canada and Greenland, called the Davis Strait. Due to the thick fog, he struggled to see what was happening. He could only hear the ominous sputtering that echoed through the deafening Arctic silence. Knowing the helicopter like the back of his hand, Sergei realized something had gone awry. The belt that connected the engine's power to the rudder blades had broken. Looking at the rapidly decreasing manifold pressure gauge, Sergei's face lost color. The helicopter's speed followed suit, and eventually the helicopter turned towards the Earth. Falling at approximately 17 feet per second, Sergei headed toward an ice floe the size of a basketball court. However, he realized he wouldn't make it. He maneuvered the helicopter towards its side, tilting to the left to smash the blades against the frozen waters, safely skidding on the surface. Thanks to his world-class piloting, Sergei had landed unscathed. However, as the water entered, it took no time before he was chest deep inside the cockpit. He had to think fast and gather the most essential supplies he could, a raft. Yanking it with as much force as he could muster, Sergei swam to the surface and onto the nearest ice floe. Soaked to the bone, alone, and in the middle of nowhere, Sergei was in the worst place to be, in the kingdom of the Arctic King. Sergei's gaze strayed from the ice and over Davis Strait's turbulent open waters. A lightning bolt in his chest struck him. It was regret and Sergei wanted to punish himself for his mistakes. However, there was no point, and he must get to work. 
Blowing up the life raft, Sergei lay beneath it, shielded against the wind. Hypothermia eventually reared its ugly head, making Sergei realize that all he could do was sit idly by and wait for rescue. Thankfully, Sergei's friend, a Russian-American named Andre Kaplan, who was tracking Sergei's journey online, managed to call a pilot friend in Moscow. Thankfully, this initiated a call to the Joint Rescue Coordination Center in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Dispatching two C-130 Hercules aircraft, the search for Sergei began. However, the middle-aged Russian pilot did not know any of this. He could only hope his GPS managed to send his location before sinking into the frozen depths of the Arctic. However, as vital as it was, the GPS was the least of Sergei's problems. Right now, unbeknownst to him, a sinister force brewed nearby. Standing almost 10 feet, the polar bear waved its head back and forth, picking up the air for the scent of its prey. The massive beast knew well the scent of a whale carcass or a ringed seal moving underneath the ice. However, this time it picked up the unfamiliar signature of a defenseless Russian stranded on an ice floe. After spending nearly four hours on the ice, Sergei was conserving his energy inside the life raft. Suddenly, he heard the sound of heavy breathing followed by the ominous crunching of snow. He peeked out from under the raft seeing a small slither of the outside world. There it was, in plain and perfect view, a massive polar bear a few feet away. It glistened from head to toe after swimming from flow to flow. Sergei's heart sank to his stomach. Suddenly, his fingers felt fiery, hot, preparing him for a fight. It was absurd, he thought. A rush swept over him and he tried his best not to scramble in fear. Sergei hid beneath the raft hoping the polar bear found him uninteresting. It did the opposite. The massive creature paced toward Sergei with that distinct predatorial gait. The bear got so close to Sergei that he could see the ridges in its black foot pads. At this point, Sergei thought he would surely die. However, the hardened pilot would rather be felled kicking and screaming. With a primal rush, Sergei sprang from the raft, flailed his arms as high as he could, and rushed towards the beast. He screamed with such ferocity, he almost couldn't recognize his own voice. Sometimes, bravery pays off. The bear got terrified of Sergei, and it jogged away from him. Sergei chased the beast off until the flow's edge, prompting the bear to nimbly launch itself toward a neighboring slab of ice. It gave Sergei a look with its black, beady eyes before heading back into the mysterious Arctic. Unfortunately, it would not be the last time Sergei would encounter these beasts. Later that same day, a helicopter whizzed past the ice. However, Sergei deemed it was at least a few miles away. Hidden in the thickness of the fog, he prevented himself from firing his last flare, as it would be impossible to see anyway. He clenched his teeth as the sound of rescue disappeared, another bear visited him. Sergei implemented his previous tactic, and it worked. However, he had become worn out from the cold, exhaustion, and the lack of food and water. The day drifted into the afternoon. Sergei found a dip in the ice and placed his life raft on top, creating a waterbed. He closed his eyes and thought of his family, his wife Jane, and their children. Drifting closer to sleep, Sergei's senses were awakened by the familiar sound of crunching snow. A third bear walked past again, sniffing the air and trying to understand Sergei's signature. As it approached him, Sergei responded with what worked before. He bolted up, flailed his arms wildly, and screamed. The bear was scared away, just the same. However, at this point, Sergei began thinking of ending his life. He could not fight off another bear nor did he have the energy left to do so. Sturgay drifted into slumber as night was arriving. He shivered in despair on the ice floe. Suddenly, Sergei could hear another helicopter. It was closer this time. Springing with all force he could muster, he grabbed his last remaining flare and shot it into the sky. With the sky clear now, the helicopter spotted the Russian pilot. Sergei could not have seen a more beautiful sight. He screamed, flailing his hands as high as he could, and with luck on his side, there were no bears in sight this time. Sergei was eventually rescued. Unlike the horror stories of the Arctic all too familiar to him, his case ended on a happier note. Sergei flew to Ottawa to sort out his documentation after losing his belongings, which included his passport in the crash. He eventually returned to Russia in the loving arms of his grateful wife and children. Sergei's case was rare. Getting lost in the Arctic usually ends poorly. 
Thankfully, the quick action of his friends, the rescuers, and Sergei himself allowed him to live on to tell the story of the day he narrowly escaped his final affliction. Two cousins, Tok and Nat, set out to the Arctic Circle at the northern end of Canada looking for seals to hunt. They were a member of the First Nations tribe and natives of the area of Teleok. With some of the harshest winters of any place on Earth, the geography of this region is inaccessible to travelers or hunters from the south for most of the year. Only in the spring does the heat warm the ice sheets enough to let the seals surface, giving hunters ample opportunity to lie in wait and kill them. The Aborigines had come to appreciate the utility of modern technology and had adopted many of the modern hunting and transportation tools that helped them hunt a lot more efficiently than otherwise. They had snowmobiles and rifles on this trip and possessed elaborate maps to make sure they were never lost. Their embrace of modern technology was somewhat eroding the natural appeal of their indigenous culture, but was also materially uplifting the lives of hundreds of people in the tribe. The wildlife of this frozen wilderness comprised of animals typical of the harsh, cold climate of the Arctic Circle, with wolves, fox, seals, moose, and the infamous polar bear populating the vast land. Polar bears are the apex predator of this food chain, Weighing more than 800 pounds and being over 3 meters long from head to tail, the bears are known to devour seals, walruses, and even washed up whales. These formidable predators can even prey on humans if desperation forces them, as evidenced by the hundreds of recorded attacks over the past decades. But recently, some polar bears have ventured further down south due to the effects of climate change, looking for seals and small fish in the water on the northern Canadian coasts. The relatively warmer climate meant an abundance of prey even in the winters. On this fateful day, at around 9 a.m., Tok and Nat loaded supplies on their snowmobiles and headed 47 miles up north, where the seals were likely to have surfaced. Even in the warm summer, seals rarely stray far from the coasts, forcing hunters to journey to the prime hunting ground to the edge several miles away. At the end of an hour-long journey in the freezing cold breeze, the duo finally arrived at the edge of the land where the vast expanse of the sea opened up. Talk had been exhausted by the trip, and the cold wind at such high speeds froze their limbs numb. They needed time to recuperate and warm up, as they looked out into the distance standing at the edge of the continent. Their snowmobiles parked several feet away were the only thing that could take them home safely, and they were acutely aware of the predators that walked this frozen wasteland. It was early spring and most of the water was still frozen, with occasional openings and holes where seals would resurface from beneath in order to rest or feed. The two men realized that hunting seals would take more patience than they thought, as most were still underwater and the afternoon sun had not yet softened the ice sheets on the water enough to puncture. They looked around for a place to lay low and out of sight for the seals. Tok found a slight slope on the ground towards the edge just enough to hide the width of his body and laid down in aim with his gun loaded. Nat realized that they could ensure greater catch if they split up and decided to walk several hundred feet away on the left to lay down in the same fashion. Several hours passed in contemplation for seals surfacing, but none was yet able to make a confident shot. But as Tok laid low on the icy shore, he heard something very different than a seal. There was no one around but him, and the subtle grunt seemed to be coming from behind him rather than the front. Frozen in place in his tight clothes, he managed to turn his head back anticipating a moose or fox, but what he saw sent shivers of terror down his spine. Camouflaged among the white snowy background stood a giant polar bear just a few feet away. It didn't look threatening at first, darting its eyes around and not looking straight at him as if uninterested in an attack. But Tok's heart was beating out of his chest, and it was difficult to stay calm or play dead. He locked eyes with the predator once, and that's when the bear made its first steps towards him. Tok turned his head back and curled into a fetal position in an attempt to hide. There was nowhere to run in the vast open expanse, and he knew jumping into the water would also be his last mistake. With his head on the ground, he felt the touch of the bear's nose on the back of his neck, sniffing and breathing, trying to decipher him. But just as swiftly, the bear took steps back and started walking to his left. Tok lay there and peeked from between his arms where the bear was going, 
It was several feet away now, and he saw the chance to get up and walk to his snowmobile. He rolled away silently and got close enough to board the vehicle and ride away to a safe distance. But he soon realized that the direction the bear had gone was also where his cousin Nat had positioned himself, completely oblivious to the massive danger approaching him. Between Nat and Talk was the giant polar bear and there was no way to warn him. Talk was too rattled from the harrowing encounter to follow the bear or run past it to warn his cousin as it chased Nat's footprints in the snow. Caught between trying to save himself or save his cousin, Talk made the frantic decision of going back to find help. This one decision proved fatal for Nat, as he was caught vulnerable and unknowing of the predator chasing after him. A few minutes into the journey, Talk realized he didn't have the heart to leave Nat behind and turned his snowmobile back. But when he arrived at the scene, he quickly realized that it was too late. In the distance, Talk spotted a blood reddened spot on the white snow with the bear chewing on the remains of his cousin. He let out muffled screams of terror and regret, watching helplessly the bloodied carcass of his cousin who had been deserted at the moment he needed him the most. The bear had torn him apart with two of his limbs lying separate from his torso. The bear had delivered a crushing stomp on the man's neck while he laid completely oblivious, hidden in the white snow. It broke Nat's spine and left him paralyzed and completely vulnerable. From then on, he was easy picking for the bear as it tore into his flesh and ate him alive, biting out chunks with its razor-sharp teeth. There were also deep bite marks on Nat's neck from the bear's three-inch long front canine teeth that had pierced deep into the flesh. Talk realized he was too late and there was nothing he could do now but escape and call for help. His family and town were made aware of the tragic demise of their family member, and state authorities were alerted to bring back the remains of the young man. Seal hunting trips were put on hold for the duration of the year, and search teams were dispatched to locate the polar bear in order to avoid further attacks. Nat's family and friends were left devastated at the loss of their son, and Talk could hardly recover from the immense regret of not doing enough to save him. Researchers concluded that the bear encounters in the area were becoming increasingly commonplace owing to the plentiful fish and seals that northern parts of Canada hosted. Polar bears had started going long stretches of time without prey in the frozen Arctic and were being forced to descend in search for flowing water where they could find small fish and seals. The rising attacks have also been attributed to the expansion of human activity and settlements, as well as conflict over catching prey like fish and seals in the flowing water rarely found throughout the year. But Nat's death was a particularly gruesome reminder of why humans and polar bears should never have to cross paths. For poor Nat, his final moments were in a state of absolute terror and helplessness, being unable to move and eaten alive from the inside by the razor-sharp teeth of a vicious predator of the icy world, slowly succumbing to his final affliction.